The fact is, there's no such thing as man-made climate change. So, uh, I think we have to go back to this. Right, so standard climate theory will say heat in, will heat out. And you just have some equations. I mean, obviously, they are about, they're about reflectivity and lots of stuff. But you basically say in equals out, and the out, how much radiation comes out, depends on the surface temperature. You solve it for T. However, all their predictions fail. Uh, what we say is something different. And you see, and in this model, where the jet stream is depends on this temperature. Right? Whereas we say the temperature depends on where the jet stream is. So what actually is happening is solar particles come in, move the jet stream, and if the area goes up, there's more snow and reflectivity, and that will then reduce the radiation in, so it gets colder. So in the diagram, solar activity moves the jet stream, and in the case of solar activity going down, say, the jet stream will go south, and reflectivity will go up because there'll be more snow, and therefore the light coming into Earth the radiation, the main energy, will go down and that will make even more snow. So there's a feedback mechanism, a magnification of this process. And then you do actually solve for T, yes. You have the new input lower equals some output, but it's got to be average over time. And you'll get a average temperature out, you see? So that's our fundamental difference. Um, and what we, the basis of it is a paradigm shift on ideas. Now, um, there is another new idea around, or a purportedly new idea, which is not actually a paradigm shift, but a paradigm correction. And this is from Ned Nikolov and Carl Zeller, who I met uh, when I went to America in 19... Uh, no, 20... I don't know when it was. 2008? Something like that. And they talked to me about their idea. I said, great, it's obvious, just do it. Um, what they say is, look, the amount of, of air on the Earth is a fundamental thing which controls temperatures over long periods of time. Because as you go up in the atmosphere, the temperature goes down. The upper part of the atmosphere has to be in equilibrium with the sun on average. So that determines the temperature of the upper atmosphere. If the, if the atmosphere is very thick, as you go downwards, it's going to get warmer and warmer. The surface temperature will be more. So that is why Venus is very hot, um, because it's got tons and tons of atmosphere. And in the past, there was more atmosphere, and it was warmer, uh, generally speaking. And um, the atmosphere was so dense that pterodactyls could fly. But if pterodactyls were here now, they would not be able to fly. The atmosphere is about half the density it was as then. But that, that, they, they explained this, which, but it was all already known, but they put it forward as a new paradigm, um, which is probably upsetting the uh, warmest. Well, half the warmest never even knew it was true anyway. Others of them thought, well, yeah, but hang on, we learned that in Physics 1, but, well, we've just forgotten it now, and we tell you it's climate, it's, it's CO2. But uh, they're making good headway, though, and it's, you know, it's brilliant what, they, what they're doing. And there's a third thing I want to mention, which is really extremely exciting, but unfortunately he's not here. Mike McCulloch, um, called, he's got a Twitter thing called New Edge Physics, where what he's doing, he's come up with some very interesting ideas about what happens at the edges of galaxies, and basically says there's a new way of understanding forces, where he sort of talks about information waves as big as the universe, right? This is a bit mind-boggling, you might say. But it does come up with answers. And for example, if it can provide a 1 over R force between bodies, as well as the 1 over R squared of normal gravity, then you can explain why, as you go outwards in a galaxy, the speed of particles just becomes flat and the size of most um, galaxies are all about the same. Uh, I won't go into it in, in any more than that, but if it's true, of course, what he's putting forward, I mean, it's been around a while, but it, it's gathering 
momentum, dare I say, because uh, he's getting results which appear to work. Now, but again, you see, in the field of physics, this is, although it doesn't, it's nothing to do with global warming, it does upset certain established views in physics. And in my opinion, the rate of progress of physics is being severely curtailed by just the way it's structured, and indeed all science is structured. You see, I saw something recently, and someone said, how come there haven't been any new basic ideas in physics since Einstein? Or, 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 or well, maybe not Einstein, but Niels Bohr, you know. Well, hang on, that's true, you know. You had this sort of gap. And I think the reason is more and more, because the academia are essentially corrupted into whatever goes, goes. And what doesn't go, is stopped. And, and the Royal Society is a professional body of back scratchers. I, I, you know, I mean, I've known people in there who basically, off the record, they say, oh, that's, what they're talking there is complete crap. But they're not going to stand up, you know. It's, it's OK, our professor, you're, you're doing well. You're doing fantastically. And then, oh, so are you, John. Yeah, so are you, John. So they all <laughs> scratch each other on the back and don't criticise each other in, in public when people outside the box have got plenty to say. But... When some of us went to the Royal Society, big discussion meeting, and we put forward a number of things, and we put them right on the spot. Their answers were nonsense, and we looked in the minutes of the meeting. This was a Royal Society open discussion meeting. There was nothing there, completely nothing there. It was like being in Russia under Stalin at the Russian Academy of Sciences. If you said something out of line, what you said wasn't there, and quite likely you wouldn't be there either next time. We haven't been executed yet, but, you know, it, it, this type of approach holds back science. And we've got to break out of that, which is what the academy, if we get it off the ground, can do. Now, we've got completely no money, but an ICO could help, of course, but that might take time. But the other thing is Ivan, who has an amount of money, is going to be funding the book to make sure it definitely gets out along with Philip Foster, the first book, and he's got some way of getting hold of a building. So if you want to have a building, which presumably you'll own, but you know, it's a building, uh, we can hold events in there to promote, promote these alternative ideas. Okay, well I'm about to finish now and say I think the message of all this is, and this is especially for young people in Momentum, and older people in Momentum, um, that things are not what they seem. And that's going to be especially true this year. And I've noticed in Momentum there are people more who are questioning all the sort of given ideas that, you know, um, the European Union is good. Okay, not so sure now, you know, after Greece you think, oh, they're eating grass, that can't be good. But the point is there is more questioning, but there's got to be loads more questioning. We've got to question everything. You see, my own beliefs on a whole number of things have changed radically in the last 10 years, you know. When I went to Imperial College, it was, oh, science was good. As long as you did science, the world would be improved. Well, hang on. I've discovered science itself has got a political dimension and it can be completely used against people. Or fake science can be used against people, but the public don't know the difference between fake science and evidence-based science. So, the, um, the front lines in all this stuff, I would say, are the carbon dioxide con, which I think is used as a very big belief system to brainwash and corral people into all sorts of things, as I said, reduction of wages, deindustrialization, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, and there's a whole lot of other sacred cows in fake academia which will have to be destroyed. You know, I mean, I know from my experience in astrophysics that you know there were lots of religiously held ideas which were like completely opposite to each other, but you couldn't often get discussions between them because maybe grants, I don't know, egos, I'm not sure. So I will end by saying then that we have to now fight for evidence-based science and politics and total accountability in all things. Thank you. Yay.